Okay, so hi, I'm Tarek. Uh, I am a historian, and um, I want to thank Golumi for putting together this amazing thing. I want to thank the Center for the Chosri Center for Bangladesh Studies, Sakia, Bunita, and Roya for like being awesome and for being patient with me while I don't reply to emails on time. And I'm sorry. Um, and, and I really want to thank and it's just wonderful to be here with two friends and amongst a company of recent books that are just awesome. So it was actually my chance to read things that I'm supposed to read, that I'm to read and it was great. It's been a great um, week of doing that. Um, so I thought I'd just take hopefully less than 10 minutes to give a sort of, I mean, I'm a historian, so we just do, we do narrative, right? So to give you a sort of a narrative bones of what my, the ground my book covers. Um, so the book actually asks one question, and I kind of try to stay true stay true to it, is what happens to peasant life as peasant men and women start producing for global markets and start producing in large numbers for global markets. And in my case, the commodity we start producing is jute, the, the coin that comes really defined, East Bengal, the Bengal Delta, Bangladesh, in many ways. Um, and then the book charts between about the mid, from the mid 19th to the mid 20th century, it charts two periods, one a first period of relative prosperity and a second pe a period, of, period of rapid immiseration. And I'll talk about how that works out hopefully, and I won't let you lose track of what I'm saying. Um, but this, the politics of that relative period of prosperity and the relative period of, of, of immiseration, the period of rapid immiseration are very different, and I kind of chart those changes. Um, and what I think my main intervention in terms of peasant studies is, I tried to change the, the, the locus of peasant politics, of peasant life, peasant economy, away from the farm to the marketplace. To me, like most of what happens, including exploitation, including the expropriation of surplus value, to use old fashioned terms, um, and also peasant politics, the locus of where most peasant politics is focused, it's in rural markets. Um, in the first phase, the relative period of peasant prosperity, which actually was secured, oddly enough, by peasants being able to produce sufficient rice um, for subsistence in addition to commercial crops. Um, so they didn't depend on the markets for food. Um, that period of prosperity was found in a range of consumer goods. And this is how people indexed, how people recognized this period of prosperity, was in their increased consumption of many different consumer goods. So I'm reading out a quote from a colonial official, a Bengali colonial official, writing in 1913. Um, the jute cultivator is notoriously improvident. The high prices he has been getting during the past 10 years has turned his head altogether and upset his domestic economy. The large amount of cash that he handled has made him extravagant, and his style of living has ri risen in a remarkable degree. He eats much better, wears better clothes, and lives a cleaner and more sanitary life than before. His house has improved, corrugated iron has taken the place of thatch, and the compounds and gardens are cleaner. He educates his children in many cases, sending them to English schools, which are fast bringing up, calls in doctors in cases of illness. Um, he, he indulges more frequently in litigation and marries more wives, paying a good deal more for each than the one before. <laughs> um, and all these sort of series of marketplace exchanges, and so you know, when, when people looked at a peasant home, they saw corrugated iron, they saw kerosene oil and lamps, they saw needed <coughs> safety matches, they look at peasant bodies, they saw Manchester cloth for silver ornaments. Um, and all of this, I argue, is, is a result of a deeper entanglement in market exchanges, an exchange for jute for a range of consumer goods. And what the move I make in my book is to sort of resituate Bengali Muslim peasant opposition to Shah Deshi in this politics of consumption. It wasn't that, you know, that their, their, their resistance to it was because it was a direct attack on what I describe in the book, at least, as sort of pleasures of, of buying something, um, a token something in a marketplace. And I go through in individual episodes of that. Um, this period of prosper prosperity, relative prosperity, indexed by very simple goods, really, corrugated iron, a few yards of Manchester cloth, kerosene oil, metal utensils, gives way to immiseration um, in, after World War I, and it really intensifies, culminates in the Bengal famine, of course, and there's a very rapid period when um, peasant immigration is total. Um, and markets stop being these places where you can refashion yourself with new goods, buy all these kinds of new, cool commodities, but they become places of stress, where peasants are finding it more and more impossible to secure simple subsistence. And in this period of, 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 rel 
relative of immiseration, rapid immiseration, we find a new genre, and I kind of love these poems I came across um, in the archives, Bengali poems, kind of a buoyance, we meant to be sort of recited out loud in the street corners, which really kind of addressed present immiseration and came up with the language of ethical engagements with markets that are Islamic, truly Islamic, truly peasant, um, Muslim peasant behavior, um, which would enable peasants to escape this kinds of, like the forces of the market driving them deeper into poverty. Um, well, I mean, and I, I could quote endlessly from this point, but I'll give you a few. Behuda Korot Jeva Korilo Shoitan El Pai He Who Spends Frivolously Is Satan's Brother, um, written in 1923 by Sheikh Abdul in Noahali. Um, or uh, one of my favorite ones is written by uh, Ashrafuddin Ahmed in a poem called Muslim Bani, published in Kumilla, that Albert on your head, I'll tell you what an Albert is. It is a crooked gardener's cut. <coughs> an, Albert, I'll tell you an, Albert. an Albert is a haircut named for Prince Albert, Queen Consort of Victoria. That Albert on your head, so peasants are being lampooned for getting haircuts, fancy haircuts. That Albert on your head is a gardener's <coughs> crooked cut. So much oil for your Albert that there's a crisis of oil in the country. They don't go to the village barber shop to get their fancy haircuts for two annas in town. Um, and this trope of like pricing everything, of really talking about the market as a place where you have to balance expenditure, where you have to save, you have to kind of come up with a savvy way of engaging markets to survive. And more than that, this savvy engagement makes you not Satan's brother, but a good, proper Muslim peasant is something I address there. Um, the book ends, just to go on to like the third moment, in sort of locating a politics of peasant Pakistanism, to use a horrible phrase, but okay, peasant politics of Pakistan, <laughs> in this sort of the idioms of, uh, of, of, of good ethical behavior towards markets. And what I really look at, and I won't go into the detail, maybe it will come up later, what I really look at is this, the, how the British invented category of the rural Mohammedan voter or constituency or representative is invested with meaning from below, through poems, through this idea of what makes a good Muslim peasant. And this investment of this sort of way in which this, uh, this category imagined in this communalized politics and this classic story of separate constituencies, but how this category takes on real lived meaning um, really draws on, I, I try to argue at least, um, this sort of shared discourse, this emergent discourse of what it means to be a good Muslim peasant during a time of immiseration. And the book ends in partition and Pakistan in the immediate aftermath of that, and with the newly created Pakistani state turning rather brutally on the peasantry who basically supported the creation of the new nation on the grounds that they wanted more tax from it. They wanted to be able to, they took this commodity of empire and made it a national resource that would produce revenue for the state. And that entailed a significant degree of violence this is the kind of art I try to draw historically using the Bengali Muslim peasant Jude cultivator. And I'll just come back. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, so um, you know, I'm not a historian of the modern period, so let me offer you my own sort of summation of this book, which I think was a really pleasurable and fun book to read for me. I think it's in November. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, then ask a couple of questions. But I sort of want to sketch out the arc as I see it. Um, you know, the title of the book, A Local History of Global Capital, is actually a very contentious and polemical title in a sense. And I really appreciate the polemical heft of that title. Uh, no, but it's not just about publishers. You know, I think, I, think that, I think we were all at graduate school in a moment when a kind of global history was the only history to write. Um, and we were all expected, we were all expected to globalize our projects and make them transnational and you know, cross region and boundary crossing and those messages came from the SSRC and they came from the EM everywhere, right? And so area studies out, uh, global narratives in, and the target uh, that you set up, obviously, uh, the embodiment of this trend in the sense is um, Sven Beckler's book on cotton. Um, which you explicitly set up as a frame. And the frame is an interesting frame because um, the way you read Beckert, you see Beckert as talking about a global hinterland of cotton production um, in his magisterial 700-page book on the entire history of cotton. So it's a great book. But in this global hinterland that becomes syncopated and synchronized to the music of the factory in the West. Um, and that then is the organizing framework of global capital. 
And so here, I really personally have to say I really appreciated the move to push back against that framework and to talk about a kind of local response to international or larger forces of the market, of the United States market, of the global market for commodities. So I think that's a very important theoretical move and it looks a lot sharper after 2015 than I think it did before. Right? Like we're back again once more to nations and boundaries and borders. Um, so, I'll say, so I'll say that that for me is a really important, um, important framework. Um, this book tracks a first burst of commercial prosperity um, in the region of the Bengal Delta, which is, you know, and I would make the case, I, I hope to make the case in the near future, that this is in fact one of the birthplaces of global capitalism um, as we know it. But in any case, in its iteration in the late 19th century, it brings a, jolt, a huge wave of prosperity to the region, which is very quickly followed by ever more severe jolts from World War I, the Great Depression, and the famine of 43, producing the conditions of peasant immiseration um, with which we have associated the larger entity of Bengal ever since. And so this is important because this is a historical account of the production of immiseration in a land of plenty. And I think much more needs to be said and much more needs to be thought about how the cultural vision of Bengal as a land of plenty has actually persisted um, despite the material conditions of Bengali poverty, right? And so that, so, so that disjunct, in a sense, is something that your book explains in a very profound way. Um, another major contribution, I think, of this work is just the historiographical move to continue the narrative post 47. So, so many of our historical writing ends in 1947, um, but you know, the author continues this um, to the imagination of East Pakistan as a peasant utopia, to the disillusionment which follows, and this really is a salutary move, and I think it should encourage all of us to think of historical narratives uh, and to recognize that historical forces do not come to a halt um, with the rupture of 1947, and some new work is beginning to do that. So the book has really wonderful chapters on the new peasant culture of small commodity consumption, very sensitively rendered. Um, the first tensions with the nationalist project of Swadeshi, anti-importation, which you see as an economic conflict between peasants and nationalists, rather than the sort of classical vision of a religious conflict. Um, Gandhi's second iteration of the movement in 22, 21 is with the, his support of the Khilafat movement is far more successful. But his withdrawing support creates a political vacuum in which the political parties of the era will come into play. And the coming of this electoral politics takes place at about the same time as the rise of a rural discursive sphere in which authors promulgate the values of thrift as Islamic responses to overcome the precarity of this interwar period. So, so there's a kind of very sensitive disambiguation of two closely related phenomena um, masterfully done here. And I think that in particular, I love uh, the growth of the, the tracking of this growing of an Islamic identity uh, through this study of the Bayans, some of which you just read, in which authors counsel also, you know, the control of women, um, the practice of thrift, and of course the adjournment of the famous Albert haircut. I was very much hoping for a <laughs> photograph. I mean, it's, 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 it's very cool. It's getting a lot of And so, you know, and then this actually is the basis of the peasant populism, which becomes harnessed by political parties whose interests run counter to the Indian Jute Manufacturers Association, which itself is responding to the US demand for jute, which is a war demand. Um, and these complex factors have ripple effects throughout the politics of the period and are arguably constitutive of the political outcomes post-46. So this is really you know, nothing less, I hope to show you, I, mean, I hope I've suggested this really is nothing less than a kind of serious rethinking and reimagining of the entire history of Bengal from, let's say, the 1870s to the 1950s or 60s. And so it's a very significant and important work. And it raises wonderful questions. Um, so I have many, but I'm just going to ask two questions. Um, and then we'll you know, let you respond and open up <coughs> the floor a little. And one is, of course, the question of the story of global capitalism, right? So I mean, in a sense, the narrative begins with the entry of global capitalism in a very particular kind of way through this demand for a crop that is a cash crop. But the story, in a sense, 
ends with both the end of the jute trade and the end of a kind of form of life. And you know, um, the late 50s are not very far from 71. 71, you know, then ushers a long period of, you know, shall we say, stagnation, right, until the 90s. Um, so, in a sense, in a sense, the the, the effects of capitalism or of the of the kind of modern com commodity capitalism that enters Bengal in the late 1890s, if you zoom out, really just seem to be, except for a few brief moments of, of brightness, really deeply pernicious to the life and to the life worlds of that region at the 18, you know, to the present. And again, of course, we're now another moment where commodity, mm -hmm. commodity capitalism mm -hmm. is enlivening mm -hmm. Bengal, and one wonders, again, mm -hmm. you know, what will be the shocks that will sort of change this. So, you know, contra Beckert, what exactly does Bengal do to the story of global capitalism? Like, how should we rethink or reimagine the story of capitalism that we are told is the dominant story of capitalism? What is the, you know, what what is it that looking at the locality does to actually change our understanding so we can also go back to the stories of capitalism and say, you know, somewhere in the audience and say, no, you know, you you have misunderstood the true nature of capitalism because the Bengali case shows us. Right. Um, so that's one sort of big question. Um, and the other sort of question for me is a question that I'm personally deeply interested in, um, which is a question of religion and politics. Right. So there are really good historical reasons that the vast parts of the Bengali countryside, especially in the East, have a large agrarian Muslim population and a smaller and historically newer Marwari, Hindu, money lending population, right, which is more or less urban. Um, so the identity of this population as Gramyo Muslim, as you call it, is agrarian Muslim, um, which you said is really a colonial creation, so I'm sort of wondering about that a little bit. But you know whether or not it is a colonial creation or whether it has deeper antecedents, it's an identity that appears to shift over time you know, from more agrarian to more Muslim. Um, and clearly, this is not simply a story of economic shifts, right? Because um, Grow, it's not just the matter that growing Jew puts Muslims into conflict with Hindu, Hindu moneylenders, because obviously moneylenders and peasants have antagonistic relationships all over the subcontinent. Um, but that the earlier violence that you track, such as the riots in Pavna in 1926, are coded in the countryside as anti-moneylender, while in the town as Hindu Muslim. Right? Um, so you identify these shifts uh, in 46, there is really serious, undeniably serious violence that is, can only <coughs> be described as communal. Um, you recount stories of forced conversion, although they're not particularly forcible. It looks like it's more sartorial than violent. Um, though I am reminded of the story that, is it an apocryphal story you have to tell us when Gandhi goes to Naukhali? Uh, okay. Yeah, somebody eats his goats. Yeah. You know, um, the goats that he took to England. Presumably there's, 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 there's a town called Chabul Nahiya. <laughs> Literally, which 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 urban legend goes? Aren't you from Nagali? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it true? So, <laughs> so you know, so so okay. So this this would really you know eating Gandhi's goat um, is is the mark of a kind of really profound rupture, right? I mean, a, a profound national rupture. And yet, from the perspective of the rest of India, which is sort of my perspective, there remains even to the present day a much more durable subnational Bengali identity. <coughs> um, which actually is not limited by religion or by borders. Um, even if it is concentrated on the psychic possession of the city of Calcutta, um, right? So there is a kind of there is a kind of real Bengaliness which is unimaginable uh, in the other partition in South Asia, right? So there is no there is very little remnant of a Punjabi identity across that border, but there is a kind of Bengaliness here. Um, so really. Is this a story that is reducible to elections or Jew? How should we think, or rather rethink, the story of how religion and politics and economics and capitalism have played out? What are the implications for the broader for the broader story? So I'll stop here. Small, small question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, stop here, and then. We can so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll I'll do the first question first about like how do what is my intervention in in his global history of capital. And what is my intervention um, with Ben Beckert's book on cotton in particular? And I think I sort of shared a frustration that many sort of, I think, historians of the South, 
of the post colonial post colonial world did with that book, where I mean cotton happened because empire willed it. Empire willed it, it happened. Um, and there is this, I think in that writing is a sense that you could just go out from I mean empire was so powerful, they could like just shift the levers necessary to affect a whole set of range of changes in in, in peasant economy. Um, you know, implement a, a land law there, change a contract law here, um, build a railroad here, and voila, we have peasant commodity production. So I really, my, my commitment in response to that was to be like, okay, let me track the story <coughs> with a different central figure. And I think, and, and what I found with the case of Jute is that the British were frankly quite surprised when Jute cultivation took up. I mean, there's an 1872 document from, from the, the lieutenant governor saying, I do not know what jute is or where it comes from, yet it seems to be growing in huge quantities and being sold in large numbers. Um, so there's a sense of surprise that the colonial state is not aware of, even as they're like, re they are invested in cotton, but jute kind of arises um, without their knowledge. And I think similar things, I think, um, with rubber, they, I mean, they undertake a plan to propagate rubber, and they're completely taken aback by the number of rubber saplings peasants are willing to pick up, and they're like running short of rubber saplings constantly. So there is a different story that we can talk about the making of linkages between primary producers and um, European headquartered global capital that doesn't privilege European power, but looks at negotiations and contestations from the bottom. And to me, it became obvious this is a story of uh, capital seducing and then betraying. Um, seducing with the promise of new consumer goods, and then betraying by saying, well, no, no more. You have 10 years you've got to purchase them, we're done. And now you can barely kind of, you know, eke out a living off of this, so forget your consumer goods. So I think that story needed to be told. I mean, and that was kind of my intervention coming from the, I guess from, we could call it the margins, um, to make peasant producers not dupes and victims, but active agents. Um, shaping their own futures under very difficult conditions, um, and, and doing so um, and, 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 and with very kind of a great deal of self awareness. Um, and that was, I think, I mean, do you want to continue this or should I move on to question two? Um, whatever you like. I mean, yeah, I mean, we can. I mean, do, I mean, <laughs> whatever you like. Yeah, really. uh, so, question, I mean, I'm trying to avoid question two. Um, <laughs> uh, what is the place of religion, capital, and history of the world? <laughs> um, so I think the story I'm trying to tell over here and the ways in which Bengali and Muslim get negotiated in the context of a rapidly immiserating peasant economy um, being sort of crushed down by, by, by frequent shocks, frequent market shocks, frequent like crashes in prices, um, chronic um, chronic poverty, chronic sort of cash, lack of cash, lack of subsistence, chronic hunger, and so forth. Um, so to me, it's not, and I feel like, I mean, as a story, I mean, so to me, it's not obvious that identities would become political. I mean, I think it happens in things like crowds. It happens in things like bodies that have been like a revolutionary terrorism and martyrdom. Um, and it happens in elections. And it happens in elections certain ways. And, and I got caught up in sort of, I don't know why, the archive takes us places we don't expect, but I got caught up in electoral literature, electoral pamphlet literature. And what's obvious was that once the British have the, the passed their Montague Chelmsford reforms, and they designated a whole range of voters and a whole range of constituencies, they called them rural Mohammedan. And people who contested those votes, contested four elections from those parts, asked, what does it mean to be a Grammo Mushulman? What does it mean to be a Grammo Mushulman candidate? How do you know a tr if a candidate is truly rural and truly Muslim? How do you know, I mean, how do you make the claim of your true rural Muslimness when you go and ask for votes? How do you know that this constituency, and I kind of do write a lot about the border between the town and the village and how that border keeps shifting. How do I know this con constituency is truly rural and Muslim as well? Um, and I think those questions get debated in a range of places. So I look at like legislative in the legislative council, people standing up and saying, "You're taking your star poor Muslim peasants are starving while you in while you build macadam tar proof roads in Calcutta," or you look at uh, petitions by 
Hindu town dweller saying, you've drawn the maps of the town wrong. The true town is much smaller. The rest is rural Muslim. Um, so you look at the ways in which these terms get given meaning. And if you look at it, I think you're attentive to it from what's happening, what's being playing out. At least I saw how the same poems talking about, uh, and the same kind of idioms that talked about what it means to be a, a good Muslim in the context of market exchanges replay and repeat in the idioms of what it means to be a good Muslim, rural Muslim voter. What does it mean to be a right Muslim, rural Muslim candidate? And to me, this telling line, which kind of recurs over and over again, to be a peasant is to be a Muslim. To be a Muslim is to be a peasant. There is this equation, which is completely obviously not true, right? I mean, it's not empirically true. There are peasants who are not Muslim, and there are Muslims who are not peasants. Um, but the making of that equation and the language with which they make that equation, to me, was this very specific case of how, uh, how religion, capital, and identity kind of got intertwined. Um, Bengaliness, I think, is also very important, but it's somehow not questioned in the case of my, I mean, Bengaliness in the urban Calcutta case is being questioned constantly. And English words are this quite brilliant today, I think. There's constantly people asking Muslims, but are you really Bengali? Are you really Bengali, are you? And Muslims are having to come up with, no, 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 we have this Bengali Muslim um, journal, poetry, blah, blah, blah. But for my peasants, they're asking, are you truly Muslim? They're being, I mean, somehow or the other, and I don't know why, and it's a good question, I think, their Bengaliness is never an, an in doubt. But their Muslimness somehow has to be like performed and proved. Um, so that's, I mean, it's not really, enough. I mean, not, not an answer in the sense that I don't think I can give you, or I don't think I have the vocabulary for a, to, to no, think of this at a, in, a, in a global frame. I, I think it sets the stage for further questions, which I think we should open up for. When you gave your overview, you mentioned that um, the kind of period of prosperity they're also going through. And I'm wondering if you could just tell us a bit more about that kind of the pivot split. from kind of a hybrid where they're, they're connected to the global market but not dependent on it, and what happens there. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a, combi it's, a, uh, <coughs> it's a combination of demography and ecology which really drives this shift. So um, until about the late 19th century, East Bengal agriculture uh, was a expanding frontier. There was always, there was new land being brought under the plow, and the main barrier to cultivation was not the availability of land, but the availability of labor, particularly animal labor, um, cattle to plow. Um, so if you can plow as much as you can work, um, you reach, you kind of try to, at least from what it seems to the socialist peasant households, sorry, reach the point where we both grow enough rice for sufficiency, plus jute for commercial income. And if there's a market collapse, we would see these instances where you would not actually harvest your jute crop. You'd let it rot in the field, and you, you know, you, so you would let it go. You'd take the sum cost. Um, but around 1900, I guess, and I think that's yeah, it's around 1900 that, I mean, this, other people have done this work, Shuga the Boz amongst them, um, that this agrarian frontier is reached. Um, so now land is shrinking, and land is getting subdivided. And now we're basically, by about 1910, most farmers are farming less than, uh, between two and three acres. By 1930, the median farmer is farming between one and two acres, which just isn't enough land to grow enough food to feed the whole family. And in that situation, your best bet is to grow jute, in addition to some rice to feed yourself, some jute, and hope that the terms of trade between jute and rice is sufficient so you can buy rice from yourself. And that's that's the kind of that's the immiseration politics, um, that and that's 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 the kind of economy that sort of results in a market-driven family. Um, thank you. I can't wait to read the book. So, in the absence of having read the book, let me ask you a couple of questions. So, the Grandma Musharman. So, who is? Let me call it I mean, he. I mean, let me call the character he. Who is he being contrasted to? So is if, if is he contrasted to the Shabari Mushroman? Is he being contrasted to a Hindu Jomidar? Uh, Hindu um, I, I, I'm not mm -hmm. who are these series of contrasts mm -hmm. happening with? And it's a very it's a very good question. I think it's actually it goes back to what you asked as well in many ways of how the Muslim comes to be. Um, there is definitely a strain of literature where like 
So this is the, 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 when you're critiquing market consumption, you're critiquing an attempt, the, the language uses that these peasants are becoming babufied, dandified. To be dandified is to be babufied. So they're like, they, they dress like babus, they look like babus, yet the babus spit on them and kick them out. And there is this language of... And the babus uh, are Hindu. And the babus are Hindu. Okay. So it's like you're looking yeah. like a Hindu babu. Yeah. Um, you're making yourself into a Hindu babu by, with your Albert cart yeah. and your kind of fancy clothes and all the rest. So there is definitely that contrast. And there is this language that you're becoming shohure, but shohure is called coded Hindu. Grammo is coded. So these words are always interchangeable. So the spatial, communal, and class categories, Grammo, Mushulman, Krishok. So like the three words are, are all coded together. To, to be rural is to be Muslim, is to be peasant, to be Hindu is to be urban, is to be middle class, is to be a, a, a bodhra look. Um, and I think that that's the language that they use. And the thing I've tried to push back against in the book, I don't know if it's successful, is the idea that a, a Bengali Muslim identity was constructed in contrast or against a Hindu other. Um, and I've tried to say that actually it's, constru constructed, in the con it's constructed in the context of a rural marketplace and the possibilities of exchange, uh, possibilities and possibilities of exchange in the rural marketplace. Mm -hmm. So it is through. So it's so it's more of a class identity. It's more, yeah. I mean, it's a new one. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, 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 it's more of a, it's more of a yeah. class identity. Refer yeah. Um, but it, but I think that also comes with kinds of like clothing, housing, illumination. I mean, it is because you buy these things from market that you're making yourself look a certain way, and that certain way is what is recognizably. Muslim, Bengali, peasant, rural. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I most admire about your book is that you, um, you not just offer a kind of social and economic life to the Bengali Muslim peasant, but you insist on offering him an intellectual life. Um, and I, I'm thinking a lot about the ways in which historically the cleaving of the two Bengals has suggested exactly this divide that Rafa is pointing out, right? That there's some sense that what happens um, in a village is somehow apolitical. It's laboring, it's, um, it's not intellectual, right? It's somatic and economic, perhaps. And what happens in a city is cultural, it's mm -hmm. political. And I think your insistence on showing how the market is the site of intervention um, for that is, is so lovely. But I'm wondering about, for example, you know, that iconic scene in Ghari Raya, at the end where the Muslim peasants mm -hmm. are burning mm -hmm. the, the Manchester cloth and he'll, um, rut, he, he gets on his horse and mm -hmm. he, he, uh, he goes off not to stop the peasants, but because they've actually then turned their violence towards the women of a Hindu household. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you can offer us a way to think about that iconic scene through this project. Is there a way to give us some sense of what the Muslim peasant is in that moment? Can I just can I just layer onto this question, which I think you know is becoming a line of a line of question, which is just that you know I really like the argument that it is an it is a marketplace in a sense that like creates the conditions for a kind of Muslim identity, yeah. right? But it is of course objectively the case, as even and others have shown, as you've cited, that there is in fact a large you know, shall we say, inertially Muslim population in Bengal, right? To varying degrees inert before the 1910s. Um, yet something happens that actually activates those forms of solidarity. And the question is whether it is around, you know, is it Swadeshi, right? Is it, you know, is it the Montford reforms? Is it immiseration? Is it all of those? Do they, you know, is it in a sense, is it purely economic and political factors that create these identities and sharpen them, you know, so that 1946 can play out the way it plays out? Or in a sense, do they precede and are they older and are they drawn out by precisely markets um, and so forth? So, I mean, I think one of the things to, I mean, who are the Muslim peasants who are burning down? Um, the, the cloth and then turning on the, I mean, so this, I mean, I talk about the Jamalpur um, 
So in Jamalpur in 1905, in the Shodichi, there were clashes between Muslim peasants and Bhadralok um, Shodichi activists, which begin with uh, Bhadralok activists trying to stop the sale of various consumer goods in the John Mashtami Mala, mm -hmm. in a Mala, and the consumers who get coded from consumer to Muslim peasant very, very quickly. Um, they, they, they're like in the, in the colonial record, they're like interchangeably, the people at the fair got upset and they're Muslim. You know, it's kind of like it becomes like a flip. Um, they get upset because of, I mean, not because like goods they, no. so it begins with one boy who wanted to buy a, 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 a box which had made in Germany in the label and he was forced to return it. And then the people the, by the Shodishi activists said, you can't buy it, it's made in Germany. And then the people of the Mala got together and said, no, you have to give it back. And then the Shadishi activists like, re-got back together, and then they attacked the fair, and they drove away the consumers, and they destroyed the stalls. And, and then this crescendoed out of that into Muslim, Muslim men in the villages, so spatial categories again, surrounding Jamal, who laid siege to the town. They surrounded the town, and they shouted, Allah, Akbar, and so on and so forth, at the town. Um, and then, of course, a sensationalist sort of press accounts in Calcutta, Hindu women fleeing by the hundreds, <laughs> soiled in cattle cars, and, and so on and so forth, because this, the rural has now invaded the town, the rural consumer is not allowed to consume by the metropolitan nationalist, and all these sort of get submerged together. And as I guess one way of going about it is really disentangled disentangle the strands of what makes you rural, what makes you Muslim, what makes you Bengali. Um, and I think being, and that's, I guess, the, chosen, the path I've chosen is being attended to, the, mm -hmm. to those disentanglings at every moment. Um, but then is there a moment, again, when everything sort of, the whole, there's a, the, sort of the, 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 so the, the whole sort of alignments shift and new alignments emerge? Um, and it's 1946, one such moment. It's 1910, one such moment. And so Muslim politics, and this is the narrative of Muslim politics, right? Inert, suddenly, like, really motivated against the British, but then, like, not really interested in the national project of India. Um, and I think it's not great. I mean, I think it's saying, giving a narrative, you're kind of pointing out it's not a very satisfactory narrative, right? It's, it's, it's a, um, and I do think if you go at it from a different angle, not from the formation of the Muslim League and, um, and everything they do, but from, I don't know, popular politics, politics of the crowd, um, the kinds of intimacies that, that, that Poland and Ms. Jessering that hold our work together, you can end up with different kinds of, 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 of sort of timelines mm -hmm. and different chronologies of what Muslim politics may have meant, yeah. would be my yeah. long and convoluted answer. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this exhilarating discussion. Um, I have a question about how these terms of Gramu um, and Mushulma and how they sort of radiate forward into the formation of Bangladesh as a, as a Muslim Bengali nation and how that kind of like agrarian association figures into what Bangladesh, I guess, conceives of itself or how it figures on the world stage, or how it figures on, the, you know, more subcontinentally, like how those, the legacy, I guess, of those associations in contemporary Bangladeshi discourse. I mean, what do you mean, like, what I think, Ersha, they said, Dosh Rajar Gram, Bachle Bangladesh, Bachle, if 10,000 villages, or however, 86,000 villages, however many villages in Bangladesh exist, if they survive, Bangladesh lives. And we, I mean, we are just used to imagining ourselves as an agrarian country. Um, even with garments factories, even with industrialization. Um, so, yeah, no, it's a good question. So, I mean, I write about this and I conclude in a little bit. So, every time I went to Dhaka, invariably, somebody was would say, so you're going to bring Jude back. <laughs> um, so your research is to bring Jude back. And I was like, but why would you want to do that? <laughs> like, why would you? I mean, think, I mean, like, <laughs> you know, there is, and besides, I mean, if you look at this long history of, of politics against Pakistan, against the British that was anti-Jude, and then you're know, trying to like, bring it back. Um, so I do think there is this imagination that a real Bangladesh is a rural Bangladesh. The real Bangladesh is a typical rural scene of corrugated iron <laughs> and like all those things that sort of <coughs> emerge as a golden kind of construction of 
Um, there's a re and, of, uh, and, and there's a kind of rural domesticity of patriarchal authority and well-behaved peasant women who are uh, docile and obedient and so on and so forth. There's all like constructed around a peasant utopian imagery. Um, and I, I mean, I think like in many ways, I mean, it's convenient in like not thinking about Darman's work. It's convenient in not thinking about Dhaka as like. Um, you know, the center of Bangladeshi life right now. Dhaka is a town of, what, 70,000 people when it's around this period. It's partitioned Dhaka is a town of, like, 90,000 people. So you can imagine how unrural, Bang how unurban Bangladesh was until the 1990s, really, 1980s, really. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, uh, you know, we're, by focusing too much on this Grammo Musulman identity, we're kind of not seeing everything happening. Yes, please. Wonderful presentation, thank you. I, I have a thought about global capitalism, not something I know much about, and a thought about religion, which I think about a lot. Um, but on global capital, uh, capitalism, I mean, it's so easy to tell this, assume, if you hadn't read your book, that the story of Jews is a very simple one. Jew ceases to be important. You know, other materials come in to replace Jew, other ways of transporting goods. That's the story of Jew. But I do think there's an Elizabeth Warren story that you haven't really mentioned in relation to global capital. <laughs> and in the sense that, you know, you write and underline how important it is to show the agency of peasants who choose to, to plant Jew. That's a wonderful story. But then they have no choices. They are confronting terms of trade that are set by them. The empire actually does matter. Those Scottish businessmen, or whatever they are in Dundee, mm -hmm. make it impossible. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who make it impossible to sell you profitably and buy them. So that's one for us. No, it's, I mean, I think that's the rigging of global. Yeah, no, I, no, I, no I, mean, I, I do think, in, in, I mean, I do think I heard too much in no, one direction. I, I, no, I mean, I mean, this is like, this, this is, just, um, no, but I do think there is a story of yeah. power at the center yeah. that I'm not attentive to in the book. Um, and I think, and, I, and I've, I've been wondering, because I've got this question about like, but what happens to power at the center? Um, what, where are the Dundee merchants? Where are the Scottish merchants? Where is Calcutta capital for that matter? Um, and, and I think there, there is, uh, I mean, I think if I did, without the crunches of tenure, I think I could have spent, um, <laughs> and without having to get the book done in a certain timeline. I would love to be, no, I think I, I did not, I mean, I did not adequately address the, the mediation, the ways in which articulated, the, the, the peasant economy is articulated to global capitalist economy and the ways in which um, jute manufacturers in particular rigged markets. I kind of do address it towards the end when we get into the famine and with the ways in which um, em empire and capital but particularly the jute manufacturers in Calcutta got together to deliberately keep jute prices down at a time of rising prices. Um, and they literally acted like an, a, as a cartel. They colluded exactly. to hold prices down. Exactly. And that resulted in, in, in massive death. In, in the um, but it's not, it would, but I wish I had spent more time thinking of what is the IJMA in the marketplace? How is that chain of influence going down? And I don't think I did that. Right. Well, uh, this yeah. is a kind of related question. I just wonder, so there may be one story where you could have spent more time. There's another question about what does focusing on the market make us miss? We're thinking about the market in a more abstract term. So I wonder if like, the frame of the market somehow doesn't invite those sets of questions. Like it's inviting us to think about it as a set of prices rather than... Mm, instead of actual like physical... As the people who are rigging it. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think... Um, and, but I, I mean, I, I don't think I want to uh, 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 abandon the idea of the market as the locus of Bengali peasant jute, jute cultivating economy, life, society. Um, I do think a lot to that. But I do think yes, you're right. The marketplace, not as this abstract entity where we have your six, you know, exchange value, exchange value, exchange value, but as a place where you physically go with your produce, you physically encounter. Um, traders and warehouses and all the infrastructure that makes markets possible 
is, is very, very important. I tried to do that a little bit. And I talked about the growth of market towns and the new kinds of print kind of um, politics that emerged. So my poems are all printed in market towns. And I kind of talk about the rise of print capital in these small market towns. But I think that you know, right, there's more to who, who's a trader and how the good comes down. So, I mean, uh, I was going to say some last words, but Barbara, please. Can, can I say something about the religion side of it? Because I thought it was one of the richest and most interesting part of, of your book, your discussion of these um, what, locally produced printed materials. That's really another side to your, and I, I'm really asking, is this a, is this a fair way to, to present this? Another side of talking about the choices that are made. And when we talk about the identity issues, in some ways you're pretty constrained. Once the British set those categories, you've got to be a Calcutta urbanite or a rural Mohammedan. You don't have a lot of you're choice. Not, you're not sure. But how? But you make. But those. But those things that you t tell us about um, do represent a choice because you are living in a context where of despair, where people are being ruined, and you are trying in those poems and in those pamphlets to find solutions. And basically the conclusion is these are moral solutions. And these moral solutions don't, they, they coincide with being Muslim, but it's not because that's a constituency. And so if you want a language of, this is the kind of thing that Abhishek talks about a lot, if you want a language of morality, it's an Islamic language. And I think that is both a story about agency again and choices that you make, and just from the point of view of understanding communalism in the Indian subcontinent, everybody assumed, <laughs> every, you know, the, the elusive everybody, that any time a Muslim is reforming, it's anti-Hindu. Mm -hmm. And one of the real strengths of what you're talking about is that's not what this is. And can I, can I yes, just end, end our session with an argument against your um, <laughs> apology, right? Yes. Because and so this is an argument against your apology, which is that you know, jute, like who really knows what it is or looks like, <laughs> you know? Uh, most people don't any longer, I think. <laughs> you know, I think, I think like most people, I think most people under a certain age, you know, think like jute is probably what packing peanuts are made out of, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not a commodity that actually matters or has like a real life any longer. And so this, by focusing on jute precisely now and writing about it now, I think you're actually unveiling a kind of working of capitalism which is about the evanescence of commodities that come and go, that you know, uh, immiserate regions and sometimes make them prosperous, and those places shift, and mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you've actually perfectly captured the shifting work of capitalism mm -hmm. and its decentered nature, in which, of course, empire is absolutely central, but capitalism will go on without the empire, and you know. Um, and I think that that I think is in a sense. A profound implication of your book. So, on that note, I'll stop, and um, and we'll continue to the next round. Thank you.